Oh, lightning round quizzes, that sounds interesting. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, it is Thanksgiving week here in the U.S., which means generally Thursday and Friday are holidays. So it's a nice short week for us, and that means it's time for another lightning round episode. So... Before well, we get to that, while we're all in food coma, I know while we're all in food coma, you get a shorter episode to digest with. But we have a big announcement today that we'll tell you about later on. We have something new for the show. But first, oh my gosh, Allison, we got to talk about the hotel novella. Okay, so now Tokyo 2020, we have the marathon, Mara novella, marathon, Mara novella, yes, on the marathon, and now we have the second series of our. Novella. Novella. Hotel <laughs> novella, yeah. which when I saw you put this in, in our notes, I said, oh, that would be a hotel I would like to stay at, but I don't think I would. No, 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 no. Or as the French hoteliers might say, no, 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 no. no. So as we taped last week, the deal had just been announced. Airbnb became a top sponsor for the International Olympic Committee. And the IOC said, oh, well, it will be, you know, more sustainable. So cities don't have to host or they don't have to build hotels. And why are you suddenly saying this with a French accent? I'm trying to do my tea back. I'm trying. I'm, I'm working on I'm working on, <laughs> on you, you know how you would say, well, it would be more sustainable. And we have the cities would not have to build the hotel. Yeah, I know it is French, isn't it? All right. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so the the host cities wouldn't have to build hotels that wouldn't be used after the games were over. The athletes will have options for their families to stay. They can use it for the refugee program to arrange host family stays for training. All that jazz. Well, France was not happy because this was just a surprise deal for them for the most part. The mayor of Paris, as we said last week, said, hey, uh, we don't like Airbnb in our city because they are raising up the rents for regular residents. So it's now becoming even more unaffordable to live in Paris. Then it gets better. Uh, on Thursday, the hotel union in France, so it's the the lobby of all of the major hoteliers in, Fran in France, Paris, they said... We're not going to work with Paris 2024 anymore. Flat out, we are done. Because of this agreement. Because of this agreement. They are oh, furious. No. And like, it's so disrespectful. They said, we have already had 40,000 rooms set aside for the Olympics. We have been working with Paris 2024 since the bids. And you decide to throw the sponsorship on us. Airbnb doesn't have to pay the same taxes that right. hotels do. They don't have all those levies and fees that hotels have to have. And they don't have all those guaranteed things that hotels have to have too, like security and things like that. So right. they don't have to mat they don't have to pass the same inspections. They yes, don't have to meet yes. the same regulations. Right. And and wow. uh, you know, hosts on Airbnb are supposed to be registered in France. Because they are only, uh, many cities only allow them to have their residents open for so many days a year so that it doesn't take away, like, a, the ability for a permanent resident to live there. But, like, half of the properties aren't even registered on on Airbnb. <laughs> well, you know what I think is going to end up happening? We'll all be staying on cruise ships on the Seine. <laughs> Because what, there's going to be no rooms available at well, any inn. What I want to know is, because this is, I, I had a theory. I, I'm dying to know what, what happens. Because Airbnb is a top sponsor, doesn't that mean that, like, you're the IOC, you use them for everything. You use your top sponsors all the time. Like, like you know, when's the last time T-Bock had a Pepsi 
or used his MasterCard, right. you know? Right. Visa. So is, is T-Bot going to be staying on Dan's couch because right. that's his Airbnb? <laughs> right. And you know, every we read the bid books. They specify so many four and five star hotel rooms that the host city has to provide. And now the hoteliers in Paris are saying we're not providing anything. Right. Wow. Okay. Because... So this is this is definitely going to be the hotel novella. I'm wondering if John Coates was involved in this as well, <laughs> since this seems to be they're not. The communication is really breaking down right? between the IOC and its host cities. Right. And and they're just like making decisions that aren't necessarily thought out to the ramifications. Like they they get this thing in their brain that we've got this is a problem. We've got to fix it. And the solution they come up with, they like didn't think of all of the responses to that solution, which I'm surprised because you got smart people in the executive committee. I mean, t box no dummy. John Coates is not a dummy. Why are they just doing things without fully thinking it through? Because they need, you know, they need their Midwestern wife and their New England wife to tell them <laughs> why this brilliant idea that they have is not actually going to work. Oh, but this, oh my gosh, when I saw the news that, um, and this was a big article in Forbes, and they cited an article from Les Echos in France and said, in a joint statement, the president of the hotel industry, uh, which is the UMIH in France, and the president of the national group of hotel chains said, this partnership is untimely and it is outrageous to make this company that deregulates in all countries of the world a global partner of the IOC. Oops. Right? Right, right? This may be a bit of an oopsie. Right? And another group that represents, it's called the GNI, represents the independence of the hotel and restaurant industry, said Airbnb, who, quote, does not respect the rules, must be disqualified. So, yeah, they have suspended their participation in the games. And, you know, and that, like, the other issue is it ain't just the games and the, the period of time in the games. You're also talking about, like, commission meetings that they have ahead of time all of these meetings that they have for years and years that ioc members come in and have to stay or what does the organizing committee do to have decent hotel rates for contractors or suppliers or people who have to fly in and fly out for short periods of time like dan's couch yeah <laughs> right. i hope he's got clean sheets for that couch <laughs> oh. Because apparently t box coming and bring right? yeah. coat t with it. t box you will be uh, sleeping on Dan's couch. Uh, John Coates, we have a lovely uh, private room with a private bath in uh, Jean-Marie's house. <laughs> with a futon. <laughs> and an air it's mattress. A, but it's a five-star futon. It'll be yeah. lovely. Wow. <laughs> ah, this is so much fun. Oh, my gosh. So... Uh, Makes that is... your, your difficulty in finding a hotel room for Tokyo a little more palatable, <laughs> possibly. But like, yes. there's this huge controversy happening around it. But I wonder if this is really going to make Tokyo even worse. I don't know, because I think Tokyo already had a problem, a shortage of hotel rooms. And maybe an Airbnb is a relatively new thing there from what I understand. And so maybe this will encourage people to have... Uh, offer their homes up for homestays a little bit more because I, I do think that's a, a little bit of an issue but we'll, we'll see what's going on because we're also in the period of time where hotels have really jacked up their rates right it's just insane if you wanted to stay for the whole period of the games it's so crazy expensive but sell a kidney yeah yeah <sighs> but you're gonna get maybe next month or by february stuff will open up the blocks will open up and all of a sudden you've got supply so the the prices will go down maybe knock on wood well i better not eat that second piece of pie or i won't fit on dan's couch <laughs> or maybe dan's capsule hotel <laughs> <laughs> exactly i'm short enough but now i may be too wide <laughs> All right. Oh, well, we will keep you abreast of the issues. I, for one, am popping my popcorn every day before I look at the news <laughs> to see what else is happening. Oh, my God. Got to keep it interesting. That's right. Thanks, IOC. We appreciate that. Well, let's move on to our lightning round. Our first 
uh, lightning round guest is Harry Blutstein, who was the author of the Cold War Games about the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. Take a listen. Lightning round. Lightning round. Lightning round. Lightning round. Go. All right. What is your first memory of the Olympics as a child? Okay. I was seven. No, I was five at the time. And I remember in the newspapers, they had a color lift out of all the flags. And so I just looked at these flags and I thought, gee, what about all these wonderful places? And they're all coming here. And I mean, that just blew my mind. If you could go to any Olympics, even if one, if you weren't alive and be a spectator, which one would you go to? That's tricky. Um, it'd actually be fun to go back to the first, the Athens Olympics in 1896. It was one of the, it was actually a, quite a successful Olympics. The ones after were dismal failures and almost ended up the Olympic movement. But there was genuine enthusiasm in Athens. It was the home of it. It was unpretentious. It was fun. People went there for fun. And that would be great to have gone to, yes. What is your either favorite Olympic moment or a moment that really stands out to you when you think of the Olympics? Well, the one thing that doesn't stand out are the ceremonies, all the pomp and so on. But the athletic performances, I mean, you get heroics in Olympics, but there's new heroes four years later. I think it's the instances of sportsmanship that you sometimes see, the very rare instances of sportsmanship. And I can't think of any specifics in terms of Olympic history. I can think of an Australian example where I think there were, there were two long-distance runners and one trips, and the other one actually stopped, helped him up to make sure he was all right, and then continued running and won. And that was real heroics. And you don't see enough of those heroics now perhaps because it's so professional, there's so much money involved. But, yeah, if you had more of that sort of real sportsmanship, that would be wonderful. If you could be an Olympian in any sport, what would it be? Right. Nothing too energetic. Um, <laughs> you really are people. <laughs> right. Look, I love the elegance of fencing. You know, it's it's such an ancient sport, but... You know, it's just so beautiful and elegant. I'm the wrong shape for a gymnast, the wrong shape for pretty well most sports. But, uh, yeah, fencing, that would do it. it would, now, now I have to ask this for my husband. Which, which weapon would you fence? Oh, well, probably a foil because it's, you know, light and dainty. <laughs> you know, anything too heavy is, you know, you don't want brute force. You want the elegance of fencing, you know. You know, something. You, you want a weapon that you can put into your teeth when you're swinging down from a rope to, you know, save the maiden from the, the guy with the large moustache. You know, that's what I see myself as. Okay. Ben would, say, would argue differently. I can tell. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay, the only the only person I know who fences is is Jill's husband Ben, and I just got the image of Ben swinging down on a rope with a foil in his teeth, and that kind of did me in. Well, right, okay. And he would say, "Forget it, never happening." Epe is the only weapon. Okay. So then Fair you could enough. get into a fight. So anyway, well, you can just <laughs> say to him, Jill, that's something to aspire to. <laughs> If it's not his fantasy, tell him it's yours. <laughs> there you go. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. And finally, what is your favorite Olympic souvenir? It's an unusual one. It's going to be a bit of context to this. South Africa didn't compete in 68. They get thrown out. And they ran their alternative Olympic Games. Of course, there was a white Olympics in one place and black Olympics in a different place. And this was sticking their finger up at the IOC for throwing them out. Uh, may I say something that Brundage didn't want to happen. And um, they produced a stamp of a springbok uh, jumping through the Olympic rings. And I have a copy of that stamp. And that's one of my most precious and rare mementos. That is really interesting. 
How did you yeah. get it? Uh, eBay. <laughs> <laughs> in mint condition. You know, they had the best auctions down in the Southern Hemisphere. I know, this is the second time that we've heard of somebody getting the, these amazing things off of Australian eBay. What is going on down there? <laughs> That's right. One of the interesting things was at the book launch, um, I actually had a shop putter come along. And you've got to remember, she is now of some advanced age, and she was wearing her original uniform. <gasps> wow! A photo's on my webpage of her, if you want to check it out. But that was really something remarkable. But um, yeah. But that, that's my memento. Very nice. Oh, very nice. Thank you so much, Harry. You can visit Harry's website at harryblutstein.com, and we'll have a link to his book in the show notes. It's an excellent read, so if you haven't picked it up yet, be sure to do so. And I want to do my Christmas shopping on Australian eBay. <laughs> right? Seriously, I, I wish I could get access. So Australian listeners, please... Let, send me your best Olympic finds on there because apparently that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Harry. Uh, next up, we have Tim Yount. Tim is the Chief Sport Development Officer and race announcer for USA Triathlon. Take a listen. Lightning round. We have yeah. a lightning round. You don't get out of here without a lightning uh -oh. round. All right. So what is your first memory of the Olympics? My first memory of the Olympics was... Uh, watching on television, Munich, okay. the, the games with my dad. Okay. Um, I, I remember being, I can tell you exactly where I was on the couch. I just remember watching, crazy as it is, Olga Corbett, um, gymnast. And, and I just remember thinking, wow, she looks so tiny. She looks so young. You know, that she looks like she's my age. And I, I was really, really young. But that, that's my first memory was, would have been 1972. Oh, okay. Uh, what is your most memorable moment as an announcer? Most memorable moment as an announcer? Wow, that, you're, you're going to make it really hard for me. You know, I, I'm I, I'm a softie. Okay. And and so when when I speak about amazing performances, there there are there are a few that that really touched me. Um, announcing a para athlete who had thought that life had ended, and almost, woof, almost chokes me up talking about it. He thought life was done, and he found triathlon, and it changed his life, and it impacted me greatly. And this was years ago, and he did his first triathlon. And I was there, first first triathlon, and you know what? It's so sad as he moved out of out of the states. And I haven't been in touch with him a long, long time. But that was probably the most memorable experience is the crowds came out and they were on the fence line and they were screaming and yelling for him and they were going crazy and I was going crazy and I was starting to tear up. <laughs> and the announcers aren't supposed to cry in the microphone, I don't right. think. Maybe they can. <laughs> Maybe they will. But, I, yeah, but that's it. Without question. Okay. All right. Um, what is your favorite training exercise? My favorite training exercise I, and this is going to sound kind of bizarre, my trainer is in my basement, mm -hmm. my bike trainer. Uh -huh. And I will sometimes have a long, hard day at work, and I'll come downstairs, and I'll turn the lights off. It's maybe 1030 at night. Mm -hmm. I'll turn the lights off, and I'll do some hard interval sets where all I can see is the light on my watch. And... It is a, there's a song, it's called Why. It's seven and a half minutes. And I will end that workout with a seven and a half minute hard interval in the dark, completely sweat, sweaty and gross. And then I'll go upstairs and I'll have a big bowl of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just sit there and just relish in this. Oh, is this nice or what? <laughs> Try that. That's a great. Co it's a great combination. I'm telling you right now. And and it's not that long, you know. Really, I, you don't yeah. have to work out that much to get your ice cream. No, no. Sometimes you don't have to work out at all to get your ice cream. 
way. <laughs> All right. What Olympic sport would you do or coach other than triathlon? Or even the components of triathlon? You know what? I think people that know my wrestling fanaticism mm -hmm. would think he's going to say wrestling. It wouldn't be. Yeah. it would be track and field. Okay. Do you have a particular I, event? Yeah. I, I would I would love to. Love to, to be to be a really really good coach in the eight hundred. That's the, okay. that's the distance that I love the most when I ran in high school. Uh -huh. It's a distance that is um, it, it's kind of that cross between endurance, speed, and, and, and some of the other elements of, of running. That's really really hard to find that balance. But that would certainly be tracking the eight hundred meter. And and one day maybe when I retire, I'll have a chance to go to a local high school and actually work with the middle distance runners to do just that. Neat. That's cool. And then finally, what is your favorite Olympic souvenir? You, you know, it, it's funny. It's not a stuffed animal. Mm -hmm. It's, I had a, a credential when we were there. Mm -hmm. And the credential is, people are like, credential? You care about a credential as a souvenir? Are you kidding me? That credential was really the, the, the all the hard work I put into triathlon, mm -hmm. learning every aspect of the sport. Uh, donating my time, did everything I could possibly do with in triathlon. That credential sort of was my badge of thank you. It's a big thank you for all the time and energy and effort you put in the sport. And so being able to walk anywhere I wanted in the Olympic Village with that credential. And there's one thing that was attached to the credential that was probably that key souvenir that I liked the most that maybe Coca-Cola would be really happy for me to say this, <laughs> was a coin that I could put into any Coca-Cola machine in the entire complex of the Olympic Games. And it would spit it back out. I get any choice of any Coca-Cola product that I wanted. Oh. It had the Olympic symbol on it. Okay. It had Coca-Cola yeah. on one side. It had the Olympic insignia on the other side. And so that credential and that coin, it was a little coin pouch that attached to my credential, is probably what I would ha hate most to lose. You can okay. throw away the posters mm -hmm. that, are, that are now old and ragged. You can throw away some of the stuffed animals I brought back because they have holes in them and they've been beat up by, by my kid when he was younger. But that credential is, is pretty sacred to me. Wow. Yeah. I love that. An unlimited Coke coin. An unlimited. It, it doesn't work in these down here in Cleveland. <laughs> I tried it. I brought it with me. It does not work. <laughs> I was so disappointed. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, if only. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. It was so great to hear from him again. This is an interview after I heard the lightning round that I'm really upset that I wasn't oh. <laughs> able to be in on because the two things he mentions are two of my favorite things in the world, Olga Corbett and ice cream. <laughs> I know. And then it was a reminder for me to take my bike trainer downstairs for the winter and get my bike going so I can enjoy some ice cream or other treats. But I thought it was really funny because uh, because we hadn't really talked about Munich 1972 yet. And his first moment was from Munich 1972. So I thought that was a nice little synergy. Way. Yes, exactly. So thank you, Tim. Before we get to our final uh, lightning round guest, we have a big announcement. We are jo starting a movie club. We've gotten lots of requests to do movies just like we do books. So we are getting that going. Exactly. So we have a movie club host. Her name is film buff Fran, Fran Johnson, who is big time movie buff and loves the Olympics. So we are excited to have her on the show. Here's a little introduction to Fran. Fran, welcome to the Olympic Fever family. And uh, tell us a little bit about what we're going to do with movie club. Well, thank you, Jill. Well, with Movie Club, we're going to be speaking about all the wonderful movies, you know, that have come out, describe some, you know, wonderful Olympic event or just some human interest story regarding, you know, the people that really work so hard to overcome hurdles and overcome obstacles. And just, it's really exciting. It's it's really neat to watch these stories put on film and, and some of the backstories that you know, we could see that make up these people that and what they do. But Movie Club is going to be either docudramas or documentaries about the Olympics or athletes or different things that are Olympics related. We're going to try not to do movies that are fictional but have an Olympics bent to them, right? Correct. Okay. So based on a true story. Yes. Yes. So, That's based based on so that. yeah, so if yep. you were if you were really hoping to see mitch gaylord's american anthem and discuss it with us on olympic fever that's not going to happen well 
I'll work on you guys. We'll see. <laughs> All right, Fran, tell us what our first movie is going to be. Well, our first movie is going to be Chariots of Fire, which is a 1981 movie that uh, tells the story of the British track and field team when they participated in the 1924 Paris Olympics. It's an Oscar winner multiple times over. Um, it's also a BAFTA winner for Best Picture. And it's a really inspiring story. Uh, most people will know it uh, more for the famous soundtrack uh, with the Vangelis song, Char well, I think it is called Chariots of Fire. So it'll be interesting to really, you know, dive into it and discuss it with you guys. we we'll have to go back and see how accurate it was. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have mentioned this movie on the podcast before. This was one of my favorite movies growing up because we all know I have issues. And oh, I had. Oh, come on. It's supposed to be. I have never seen it, but. I know, yeah. but honestly, what 12 year old is obsessed with Chariots of Fire? And it has. That was like the first VHS tape I owned. Wow. <laughs> Well, so, I gotta say, I haven't seen it. I had not seen it in its entirety until a few years ago. And I gotta say, I was really impressed by it. Uh, the story is amazing. And Jill, you have never seen it. I have never seen it. It's one, sadly, I, I don't know why I just never saw this, but I, you know, you saw the clips, you knew the music, you ran like they did in the movie to mm -hmm. the music that everyone was singing out loud that we can't sing here because we'll get, you know, it's under royalty. But yeah, it, it'll be nice to see the movie in, in, in its entirety. And it, it's an inspirational story. And it'll be we'll interesting because I have, I have actually not watched it in several years. So oh, it'll be interesting, be cool. I know, to see, do I still love it as much? And I'm mm -hmm. curious to hear, Jill, what, what your first impressions are, given that now it's from 1981. It's a, Even though it's, it's a historical story, but that mm -hmm. it was made so long ago, if mm -hmm. our perspectives now have changed looking at it this many years later. Right. Correct. We are actually going to have our first movie club show be on the 2nd of January, but because that's uh, in the middle of the holidays, we are going to tape it on December 14th. So watch the movie and let us know what you think by then, and we will include your comments. We are so excited to get this movie club on the road. And if you have suggestions for us, please comment on the Facebook page and the Facebook group or drop us a line on Twitter or Insta at Olim Fever, and uh, we'll put your movies in the queue. And let us know your favorite popcorn recipes. Oh, yeah. You know, not just butter and salt, man. I want some original. I wonder if there's a Paris-themed popcorn we can make for this. Ooh la la. <laughs> oh, maybe like with some lavender on it, mm. which sounds disgusting after I said it. <laughs> yeah, that's no know. good. Macaron popcorn. Just got to get your raisinets ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Fran. We will talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thank you, Fran. I'm going to go do my slow motion running on the beach with some music <laughs> playing in preparation for our session. As a kid, when it came out, everybody ran slow-mo to that song. I mean, everybody I did. saw this in the theaters. I have watched it so there is something wrong with me with how much I love this movie. I don't think so. I think you should just embrace it. Oh, and hey, listeners, if you want to send us videos of you running slow-mo on the beach, oh, by all means, we would love to have your best slow-mo oh. running video contest. Come on. If you, want, if, you, if you participate in that, we will send you a little – I'll send you a prize from my little prize box because I have a whole lot of uh, Olympic souvenirs that I would be happy oh, to send to someone. That would be great. Someone. Yeah. So I will, I will go do that and, and post a video to get us started. All right. That sounds good. Excellent. All right. Our last lightning round guest is Tom Scott. Tom is an American. He is a karate hopeful. And the last time I looked at the standings last week, he is on the bubble for qualifying like he's the first position below those who had the green light already for his weight class so uh he was really interesting to listen to contributor ben did our interview with him and uh, you know i'm really hopeful that he can pull it out because he just he sounds so sharp and very engaging so take a listen to tom's lightning round lightning round before i let you go though we we like to do a little lightning round what was your first memory of of the Olympics? Of when did you know that the Olympics sort of existed? Wow. Um, 
let's see. I mean, I knew the Olympics, you know, definitely existed way before this point, but I'd say one of my favorite memories was uh, when I was 18 and we were in 2008 watching at home as a family, you know, Michael Phelps in Beijing. I mean, that was just so memorable. Uh, We were freaking out. So I I remember that point and um, that was right when I was, you know, becoming really serious in my sport and learned about making the Olympics, but even though karate wouldn't be accepted for another almost 10 years later, you know, I, I just really remember that, that. What was your reaction when karate was added to the Olympics? When, when they announced, Hey, in Tokyo, we're going to have this. We, we had a party at our karate school anticipating the announcement. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All the kids, the families, the parents, the owner, uh, all the athletes, we were all there. Uh, word was that it was going to be, but the official date it was announced, you know, it had to be done. We had everything set up and cheered and smiled when it did come out. When did you, you mentioned you've, you've, you've done karate all your life. When, when did you start? I started when I was eight in okay. 1998. And was there anything that prompted you to, to start karate? Yes. So my parents put me in it, you know, for building confidence. Okay. And that's, that's the unique part about karate that most people start karate because they need confidence or because they need discipline or they want to learn self-defense. And then they find out about the great sport. Right. And so we're trying, it's one part of my mission is to spread awareness about the karate athlete. You know, there's a beautiful sport behind it too. And, and big athletes go to the mainstream sports and then kids start karate for those, you know, those other, you know, I want to spread awareness about the awesome sport of karate and uh, hopefully it maintains its Olympic positions. If life had gone differently and you were to imagine a different kind of life, but one in which you were still an Olympic athlete, what sport do you think that might be if it weren't karate? Man, that's crazy. You know, uh, I do not know. I I think, uh, man, that, that is interesting. I think I, I was built uh, just my personality type. You know, I tried to baseball, soccer. I loved football as a kid, but not an Olympic sport, clearly. But, you know, I think uh, I just fell in love with karate because it was all in my hands and learned how to improve myself. So it would probably be individual sport, you know, something like tennis or track and field or something like that. I, I wouldn't know, though. And when you get to Tokyo, yeah, after you've won your, your gold medal, what sport do you think you might go watch? Oh, man. Um, let's see. I love watching Olympic wrestling and judo. So I probably am going to try and go find those guys. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate this. Oh, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tom. And, uh, you know, hiya! Uh- <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that's what we do. <laughs> excuse to break that out again ah good 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 uh anyway i think that means it's time for us to go to our thanksgiving dinners i'm up to a nap time i don't know about you my trip my trip to fain has kicked in i don't know i think i need another round of green bean casserole and pretzel bread (laughs) see we're italian we have lasagna well you enjoy that and i will oh i will Excellent. Well, thank you so much for listening. And uh, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, we really appreciate you listening to the show, following along and interacting with us on uh, social media. It's always it's so much fun. It means a whole lot to us to be able to talk about the Olympics with you and learn more about them and share people's incredible stories. So thank you so much. And until next time, keep the flame alive. Stay in touch. Email us at olymfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olymp Fever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. T-Box no dummy. John Coates is not a dummy.
Du, 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 du.